Okay. So welcome to activity one in legal blog. Very nice to have you all here. Okay, this activity is, as you know, protocols and self-regulation. Okay, so um, the idea here is, the idea of the whole activity here, because this is part of the activity with our guests, the idea of this whole activity is narrowing the gap between what technology uh, is able to make, and here we have developers representing that was able to make, and what the lawyers or the legal community uh, understand about it, okay? So everything here is new, all is new, okay? Lawyers will try to adapt the technology, in this case, the interactive kind of thing that we're talking today, to the current laws. And developers will tend to think that we want uh, minimum regulation. So we are here in, in a new scenario. So what I suggest is clean up your mind of uh, preconceptions, take a deep breath, and let's start, okay? So let's welcome Christopher and Jason. They are working with the interactive coin offering. Is your name there? Okay, so uh, Christopher and Jason, uh, you can unmute yourselves. <laughs> okay, so let's start with uh, Jason. Jason, um, just a quick introduction of yourself and how this idea of uh, creating a new model started. You have to unmute yourself because everyone here is muted. <laughs> you. you got it. It's good. Hey, my aunt, did you do that or did I do it? Um, anyway. <laughs> Fantastic. So my, my name is uh, Jason and we, yeah. So I, I'm, I guess, Mathematician, I've been working on a project in the cryptocurrency space called uh, TrueBit um, and some other protocols like this uh, ICO, um, well, interactive coin offering, uh, which basically spawned out of a blog post that Vitalik Buterin wrote back in, I think, June this year. Um, with this year being 2017. I have no idea when this movie might be watched. So, uh, yeah, so Vitalik basically outlined, he, he, he looked at some of the token launches that, that had taken place up until that time and um, sort of, uh, there you can think of like, I guess, to, there are many different ways to do it, but two main categories are the, the cap sale and on cap sale. And of course, um, the problem with a cap sale is that not everybody gets to participate. And an uncapped sale is that people who participate don't know what they're actually buying because the, they have no idea what the price of the token is that they're, uh, in other words, um, so, so they don't, they don't know the valuation. So that was basically what, what Vitalik's uh, post was about, that you guarantee both participation and certainty of valuation. So I, then I said, well, let's see, how close can we get to, to, to um, meeting both of these requirements? So that became the idea of interactive coin offerings. And of course I was already in the mood for interactive uh, <coughs> protocol because we, we had been working on TrueBit, which is what uh, we've called interactive verification. So um, basically the idea is that not only can people put money into the, into the sale, but also take it out within certain constraints so that uh, over time the, um, uh, you converge to like, I guess the, True market value by the end of the by the end of the sales. So the true market value. That true that's market the, value. I mean, if there, if there is if there is such a thing, I mean, basically, I call it true market value because, um, like, normally when you run an auction, 
and this type of thing you might you up the it's optimized for the seller's revenue we were trying to optimize for the buyer's information so it's uh but then of course what do we mean by information like what is useful information and when is someone communicating something just to make somebody else move and so uh, i think there's um, um so so we came up with some notion of, of information and certainly the second half of our protocol is well defined it basically says you could put in a bid that says if the sale you know put me into the sale if if the total uh, sale valuation goes over 30 and kick me back out if it goes over 50 let's say something like that. so people can put in commands like that and the idea is that in the end you can the final valuation will be um, <clears throat> satisfactory okay. will meet all the requirements of each of these bits so that you'll, um, okay so basically this all started with uh, let's say with the timing <clears throat> with all these uh, ICOs uh, uh, with mm, mm, um, uh, with this uh, hard caps or no hard cap or how is the cap and this raising this a lot of mm, crazy amounts of money with the community involved or angry because they mm, you know are out or in base of that you say okay let's think something that we can get a fair value or whatever we call it again everything is new so we are allowed to call you know to put terms here um so you create you, this okay so you start with this white paper and this proposal okay um christopher yes. um, ha, um tell us uh, of course about yourself and and how did you get involved in this interactive coin offering and right now your contribution with, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, yeah, so uh, uh, I work at uh, Modular with uh, Josh Hannon and, uh, and a few other guys. And we were in the business of you know, developing software and we were uh, doing coin offerings and, and things like that. And we, we saw these problems, of course, with the, uh, with the craze. And so when yeah, this post came out with Vitalik, well, I, we saw it and we put it off the side because we're building the technology and we were like, you know, we're going to, right now we're building, building out a platform that helps, uh, it, it eases the technical hurdles of getting involved in coin offerings to allow people to easier access. Uh, so we kind of put that to the side and, you know, we didn't think about it much. And then we saw uh, the blog post that came out of Truebit early on after Jason and Vitalik had uh, come up with the implementation. And so I asked Josh, I said, Hey, did you see this? And he goes, yeah, I saw it. I said, yeah, we need to go ahead and jump on this because, uh, you know, we can't put it off to the side anymore. It looks like it's going to pick up some steam. And, uh, and so he's like, yeah, yeah, I'll reach out. So, uh, he ended up reaching out and then we ended up getting in, in into the, uh, into the calls and, and, uh, uh, started really contributing the software that, that made this thing. And through that process, you know, we iterated a couple of times over some ideas on, how to make it work within the Ethereum framework. Um, because I kind of joked with Jason at one time, you know, the full protocol could work, you know, if we had Truebit, you know, already doing computations for us. But since we don't have that yet and we have the gas constraints, we have all these other things, uh, we, we kind of had to put it in a box, so to speak, that made the protocol work both, uh, you know, on, on the paper and in practice. And so, uh, yeah. Okay. And, and I ask, I'm, I'm asking you, uh, because when we talk about, uh, it was so, so funny with the slide because I introduced Christopher and say, this is one of the creators and, and I don't know, Jason doesn't know this, but Christopher was, uh, uh, well, I'm not a, 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 the creator. They are the creators. They uh, <clears throat> invite me to join, to join Jason, invite me. And that's very nice because that's, Another thing we have, uh, you know, like in separate compartments, like the collaboration. If you think of the legal community, you're gonna say, I, I am the blogger who said this or said that. Here, when you talk about developers, it's like this. You know, it's okay, I'm not, and so the, the funny thing was like, I asked him this like, okay, Christopher, uh, how do you call the person who is building something? <laughs> so, 
that's yeah. part of the yeah that's part yeah. of what is missing you know this gap that we're trying to narrow understand how yeah. we can work together sometimes it's mm -hmm. not like this okay perfect so uh now let's uh start with um let me see if i can do this call it okay with uh let's start with the basics okay because based on the questions we have received um we found that uh, the level of understanding is not even within the community okay so let's start with the basic maybe for you guys is too basic but maybe for the lawyers is not too basic so just to put that some concepts clear okay so let's move to yes okay uh christopher yep what is interactive coin offer is it a platform is it a protocol it is a blockchain what is it it's a, it's a protocol. It's a, it's a set of algorithms that try to give us uh, more pros than cons uh, with the current crowd sale structures. Great. So, uh, yeah, it, it gives us a set of algorithms um, that allow uh, participants to converge on a certain value. And like Jason said, you know, whether it's a true market value or, you know, you, there's always emotion. I think we've learned the efficient market theory is uh, not 100% uh, accurate when it describes markets. Emotion plays a lot into what we do. And so it's, 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 a, it's a set of algorithms that walk people through a process for you know, 30 or 60 days okay. to help them converge on a, on a value for a company. Yeah. Okay, it's, for, it's, it's just for running the token sale, yeah. correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, does the protocol create tokens? Do you design any token model at all? No, no. Uh, it doesn't create, create tokens, no. Great, let's go uh, with that. Like maybe we can go through and talk about some of the, do you want to dig into some of the pros and cons perhaps? I mean, I guess one of the properties that we have of the, the ICO protocol is that it's, it's designed, so maybe you'll remember there was a, a, a token launched um, earlier this year called the VAT uh, token and the sale they s was over in like 10 minutes and they had sold 35 million dollars and not many people got in in fact I think there was one transaction that spent almost 7,000 in transaction fees just to participate in the um, in, 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 in the sale so I mean the, I, one, of, one of the properties that I, I I think we're achieving with the, the interactive coin offering is that you don't have these kind of time constraints. Even if you look at like a Dutch auction, like, um, like the kind run by Gnosis or, or Raiden, there is, um, depending on when you put your bid into the system, it dictates sort of, um, well, it, you're, you're supposed to put it in when the, as the, <clears throat> price falls over time you put it in when it matches whatever yeah. you think is the right price so there's this time component in terms of the bid which we we one of the ways of improving security is by uh, decoupling the time parameter from the the price parameter or whatever there, i mean there are several things you could attach the time to but um uh, basically make the the, the time um, sort of uh, great because what I want to try to 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 say here is that people understand that it's not and again we're here with the basics uh, yes that is not a, a, a platform that creates token I mean there's not a token to say the platform the the protocol is not the issuer of the token is that correct okay so in is the project the issuer okay so that brings us to understand that the field of token, if it's a security, is a, is a utility, is out of the scope of this conversation because the interactive coin offer is not the issuer of the token. So, so that part of the regulation, we need to take it over of this. Uh, this is a protocol, it's not an issuer of tokens, okay? So based on that, okay, uh, Jason explain us, um, because this is a challenge, it's, it's, it, I like it. Uh, to the general public, how we can explain uh, how it works. You have the buyers, you have the seller, right? 
So uh, we, we talk about the timing, the time frame. So how is, how is the process? Right, so uh, the, the seller is the one that's issuing some set of tokens. And um, so you're, <clears throat> the idea is also that everything is um, as automated as possible. In other words, the one of one of the other parameters that we that uh, you know Christopher and I were trying to optimize in this protocol was to reduce the number of decisions that are made by the seller as opposed to, to um, so reduce the number of made by the seller and let the protocol sort of make the decision. And the advantage for the seller is that you don't get blamed for for choosing the parameters. For example, if you if whatever the the, the valuation ends up being everybody knows the protocol ahead of time so it's it's fair and it, as opposed to like and also sellers may not know what 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 price to set these things at so if you're setting if you're if you run a cap sale and you say it's 40 million well if you're if you may or may not i mean how would you even know that ahead of time so that's that's also um a tricky piece so how does it work so right, so you're 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 basically uh, you can imagine that there are two tokens in this process. One is, is since it's all done on chain, so the idea and it's all done in a public way, so everyone can see every transaction. Okay, so that's good. Good, yeah. So let's let's say you have two tokens. One is the native token that people are using to make purchases with. Let's say ether, and the other one is. I don't know what you call it. That's the one you're selling. Oh, um, uh, the, 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 how do you call it? Yeah, how do you the, call it? <laughs> put on the chat. How are you so, going to call that, that token that we are selling, that project is selling? Uh, let's say token. W, I don't know. <laughs> so, w token, okay. Yeah. Jason, um, uh, here says someone, Jason coin. <laughs> <laughs> the oh, really? That's... Jason coin, yeah. <laughs> All right, who wants some Jason coin? Okay, let's go <laughs> with a Jason coin. <laughs> so, in the, in the basically the way this the, the protocol is is written, you you just kind of arbitrarily choose a, a conversion rate between Ethereum and and this uh, Jason coin, um, and so let's say one ETH buys you a thousand. Jason coins, but you don't know a priori how many Jason coins are going to be created. So the question when you buy these tokens is more um, not not a question of, of the price, which is sort of arbitrary, but what fraction of the total um, uh, quantity of tokens that will belong to each each buyer, because that sort of determines relative value, I guess. So, um, so right, so those are the, the sort of parameters. The protocol itself goes in two phases, let's say. So our first phase is to sort of try to get some sort of information from the market before we start making this more serious commitment phase in the second part of the protocol. Um, so in the, in the first part, people are more freely allowed to put bids in and out, but you have, um, you have some, in, in order to prevent people from like, so one, one thing that we, we, we worried on, this is actually something that Earth Gulp pointed out in the um, original blog post, was that, you know, if you let people freely put money in and take them out from the sale, then, uh, you know, you could have a whale that puts in a uh, billion dollars on the first moment and takes out a billion minus $15 in the last moment and no one has a chance to react to it. And so he gets everything for 15, all the tokens for $15, which is um, probably not what you want. But uh, so, so we have to institute some sorts of, of penalties for, for okay. people who are going to do that type of behavior to try to disincentivize it. And so that's the main constraint on the first part of the 
critical. And then the second part is, as we mentioned earlier, you have this, it's, it's more constrained. So you place, you would place in a bid that says, um, you know, in, include me once the, the market cap of the, of the sale goes over 40 million and then push the, push this bid out if ever it goes over 60 million. And the, val mon the valuation should be monotonically increasing over time so that you, you end up, uh, um, this, this sort of monotonically sense. increasing. Yeah, it's monotonically it's increasing. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> but it's important because when we talk, uh, there's a lot of questions about, and, and I'm, I'm taking a little bit out of the explanation uh, about the uh, people is confused sometimes when, when, when they uh, read the first time about it uh, because of the hard cap or, or there's no cap. And because you, usually you, you, the association with the cap is the valuation of the company. So here we're, we're turning this around. We're saying, we're not talking about price, we're talking about a fraction, correct? Um, of the mm, JSON coin. Yeah. So you, basically you get, we're turning you get, you get that idea around. <laughs> uh, it's almost like the safe. You know, if you look at the safe, you know, and, and somebody comes in and, uh, with a safe agreement and they say, you know, uh, we'll take future equity, but our cap, our cap for the total valuation of the company is going to be, you know, $20 million. And then you, you have a set max percentage of, of dilution there. So you can come in with your $10,000 and say, I value this at, you know, um, a uh, hundred thousand dollars. And you know, your max dilution is going to be 10%. You could own more if the valuation is less and, and, and people come in for less, but, um, but yeah. Okay, great. Um, I'm sharing with, in, in the chat, um, Julia, Julia, uh, um, she needs to apologize here. I'm here in, uh, to, uh, uh, for Julia. Basically, she couldn't make it here. She's been working a lot with, you know, with the research of this. I'm sharing a slide from Julia's. Actually, uh, uh, she published today something regarding um, ICOs and regulation. And there's a chart there in the chat when you can see the different aspects of regulation, okay? Uh, MJ, if you're there, I, I need you to help me with the timing. Uh, let me know the timing. So, because we talk about 30, 35 minutes, I think it's a lot to cover here. Uh, you can vote if you, if you want more time. I vote yes. <laughs> uh, if, if you can spend more time here. You can put in the chat. Okay, uh, I'll be yes. Yes, just to cover because we have a lot of uh, things here. So, um, okay, here, uh, well, we have a lot of people here. Um, say hi to everything, to everything, to everyone. Okay, let's move with the questions <clears throat> we have draft. We asked the community uh, for questions and we let me see. Okay, here. Let, let, let's, let's start here. Um, if we have to find common ground, okay, lawyers in the form of, of regulators and developers in the crypto community, what do you think is something we all want? Uh, for instance, protection against fraud, protect the right to participate uh, for everyone. We we'll talk about that. Uh, proper information to the participants. Uh, what, what, what do you think we can, with a, it's a common ground to start with? All, all of us will want the same. I, go ahead. Uh, um, okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, man. This thing is kind of lag. Yeah. I'll, I'll jump in real quick. So, yeah. uh, I think one of the one of the key things to 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 separate out is you've got you've got the hard mechanics of a market, um, and that's price determination, things like that. And that's one thing I think Jason and, and, and Vitalik, when they came out with this protocol, really abstracted out. You know, uh, we don't necessarily have to worry about a company asking for three hundred million dollars uh, anymore because now we have a pure public, transparent market mechanic here. So there's two sides to you know. Um, 
transferring value. And it, it's, you know, you've got the actual valuation of everything and then you've got the who's buying and who's getting this value. So I think that, that right there is the key part. Do we need to regulate prices? That doesn't generally work. You know, free markets tend to work better than, uh, in, in, in our kind of system. But on the other side, you've got, uh, you've got companies that put out information and we've got uh, individuals who have been deemed dangerous. So uh, I think one of the, the most effective thing, if, if we were to look at like the SEC, the most effective thing they do is uh, ensure uh, information is accurate. So that when I say I'm going to make a hundred million dollars next year, they can throw a red flag and say, uh, you're not allowed to say that to the public. You know, you need to back, back, back off that a little bit. So uh, I think, I think the common ground between what we're doing and, and, and what regulars, regulators would like to do is we've got, uh, we don't think necessarily the logic needs to be regulated, um, but maybe the soft, the soft information, you know, the, the things that go out in PRs and, you know, vetting companies and vetting individuals, make sure they're not on watch lists and things like that. Uh, that's all I got. Jason, go ahead, man. Well, I just would add that I think we, one, just on a high level, we, I'd like, we'd like, like to see a strong connection between um, the price of the token and the value of the product that it represents. Because, uh, well, for example, I, I think if, if, you know, if you, you see a lot of, tokens that are sort of based around market pressure where they they um you run a cap sale you in increase the demand through marketing and you decrease the supply through 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 your cap and then you end up selling not like uh people are buying the token not for the product but just because it, they're buying a free trade and while it's great and everybody loves to get free trades i just this is somehow probably not sustainable, and I think this is also something that the SEC is uh, going to be uh, well is is concerned about. That um, uh, so sure. Yeah. So that, that's the common ground there. Okay. Connection between real price and 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 value. So that's that's uh, I think that is a a sort of um, yeah common ground. Okay, sure. that's great. That this is recording because we go over. Uh, uh, MJ, please help me with that. Uh, there's a uh, questions in the chat, but uh, I, uh, MJ, as if you can help me to 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 put off this uh, together for later. Okay, great. Let's go with the second question. Uh, Aaron is here. Yes, Aaron. Uh, how does the protocol preserve values any better or worse than the reverse Dutch auction for the participants? This was not a lawyer. <laughs> yeah, that's that is a good question. I think that goes into your decoupling time, right? I think I think that's probably the main property. I guess it depends also what you mean by preserve values. If you mean it in the sense that I was just discussing values, um, or or values. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, could be like uh, for I, for what I understand of the question is uh, like um, customer protection of the values of the of the um, participants right so i guess one could also argue that it permits more signals to enter into the um, protocol although this is a little bit hard to quantify i mean if at least you can know that someone who's signaling is not so much based on a time constraint but maybe more looking at other bits which is somehow yeah. reflexive and, and, and interesting but of course yeah I guess that's that's um, now we can that's say hard. and also the other thing that you can see is that it's uh, well I mean both I think the Dutch option is also a really viable model it also depends which parameters you attach over time like Gnosis attached the, the not only do they attach the price but also the fraction of the total tokens that's going to the founders um, and so, so there, are, there are a number of. It, it, I guess it depends on this, what, what, which of the uh, many parameters you're going to attach to, to time. But um, yeah, I would say it's very interesting, and we should experiment with, with uh, 
variants of both of these types of protocols. And also the one that was recently um, discussed uh, that Tim Haddock raised in, in our, yeah. in, in our conversation, form. which was, uh, of course, um, one which is, looks more like a Vickery auction. So that's that was another one, but it, he sort of assumed that the bids are private. So it's I'm not sure. It, it changes things a little bit, I guess. If you're if you have privacy, it becomes difficult to run things on chain. But of course, traditional economic auctions sort of rely on privacy. So this was actually the the two technical achievements, I guess, of the interactive coin offering is that one we're able to get it within the gas limit, and the other one is that we don't hide any information, there's not even any commit and reveal, so there's no way that someone can sort of. Uh, right, uh, okay. Yeah. Either you commit and you, everyone sees it or, or else you participate. And we will see, we will see how, how it's evolved in this because again, uh, we, uh, uh, this uh, room for uh, experimentation here. Okay, oh, look at that. Where are the risks? What are the risks? of collusion that you have identified or that you are working on to improve? For instance, seller colluding with the buyer who happens to be his brother. <laughs> have identified, <laughs> because you are right now building it. And so the question is, have you uh, been able to identify and correct that while building or, or you don't see any risk there? Um, early on, we, we, we took away the, uh, you know, the free uh, bidding and withdrawing, you know, that was, that was one risk that was identified that was valid that um, we, that we, Jason went through the whole process of, of developing the penalty for. Um, and um, so that was the main one is, is uh, just buyers pumping uh, possible, the possible market value or we're trying to get in cheaper, um, but collusion between buyers and sellers, uh, I'm not sure. The seller, I said the seller doesn't really show up in the, in the picture here. I mean, the whole idea is to yeah. get them out. They don't have, there's no action that can be taken by the seller once the protocol, once the smart contract is deployed, the seller is, is kind of, they, as opposed to, actually this is one, if you contrast that with, with Tim's suggestion where, uh, Basically, he was saying every buyer comes in with their list of, of um, well, what we call the valuation table. The economists call it a um, uh, the list of bids, where you say you say here's here's the, the order book, is it the order book, order book. Oh, order book. Yeah. It is called. Um, so I'm I guess I'm revealing my bias here a little bit, but so you have this order book, and at the end, the seller just chooses uh, based on those the order book what he actually wants to sell. Well, now you have an opportunity for collusion because the seller actually plays a role in the sale. So for here, I, I think that there isn't really anything to worry about. You just have a bunch of buyers and a smart contract. Yeah. So, and buyer, can buyers collude with each other? Um, uh, I suppose in, in theory they can communicate, but I'm not sure that putting, combining two orders together, I and mean, what can they do? That's the question. And exactly, yes, uh, they can communicate, great. Uh, and so what? So, how it so what exactly? I mean, I hope that's that's as far as it goes. Uh, yes. Yeah. I mean, we, we we in yeah. I'm not aware of any benefit that you can get from combining your orders together. I don't know what other kind of collusion you would have, but I mean, I suppose you could pool money and try to push it in and out to create signals in the market. But <laughs> yeah, or withdraw at the, at the last moment. Maybe. Yeah. I, I just don't know if it would, it, would, it would be hard to incentivize people to, like, if people, if, 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 unless the rewards are clear, like, people might, I don't know if they would join the pool, but maybe they would. I mean, you'd also have to have, like, a smart contract that says when people get their money back, and some of it might, of course, if they're pulling money, some of it might get forfeited through um, deposits. Like, we, I think what happens in the first part of this, so you get, you get burned if your 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 money gets no it doesn't get burned it gets locked into the sale that's that's what it does so um, 
I think it's still a work in progress, especially the first piece of the sale, which is more of an art than a science. The second um, one has more mathematical properties to it. So can look into it further. So the good thing in these discussions here is that you have a different uh, minds thinking and different problems. And yeah. as, as well as you bring something new to, to this legal community, explaining something, you can uh, take advantage as well of the minds that think differently, like this kind of question, you know, what happened in a seller, has a, his brother is a buyer and things like that help, uh, are helping you to think and, um, you know, and, and probable things that you haven't looked uh, before. It's a really, really good question, and you should always ask this question on every, you know, in, in every protocol in the space. Like, if don't ever assume that someone's going to run the software that you give them, right? I mean, right. That's that is the um, uh, yeah. So in, in crypto, in any blockchain activity, this is uh, always. And, a, and, and also throw out there, you know, uh, as far as from the development community, you know what. We're not we're not speculative, you know. Um, the the big projects that raise the big money, um, you know, they get a lot of attention because of the values. But my perception is there's more risk in the guys raising not a hundred but maybe five million dollars on something that just doesn't exist or and won't exist, you know, um, that sort of thing. And and pushing things to crazy valuations, we don't have that interest, you know. Um, we don't have a competing interest with regulators like we want all these values to go up skyrocket um, and, and, and ignore regulation. Uh, we're interested in keeping values in a certain equilibrium because, you know, the worst thing that happens is, is when markets go way up and then, and then collide on us. And because in our technology, you know, it has to freeze for the six to eight months it takes for the market to come back, you know? So just throwing that out there. Interesting regulatory question. Like, I mean, this is kind of a crude tool, but what if you just said, all right, if you, all, all cap sales are now against the law. Now it gets, you have to get kind of creative to run a scam. I mean, you have to, you might actually have to produce something. So I, yeah. I, I mean, that's kind of a, a, a crude step in that maybe, maybe even much simpler than take, trying to use an interactive coin off. Can I say something? But, um, that's that's good. Actually, uh, we're gonna. I think uh, Bernie have a question later. Let me just finish the one I have here about the cap in this, and we can retake this point because it's very interesting, and it's something that even even when you work with projects and you are on the communication side, which is my case, uh, it's very exciting that you have you say, okay, if we don't have a hard cap because we're gonna go with the interactive coin offering, you have to create, design from scratch a new message. <laughs> yeah. Well, so I, 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 I like to maybe propose a, a second law, which is that um, for, uh, for every dollar you spend on marketing, you have to spend $100 doing something useful. Um, and uh, I did, of course, these notions are, need us to you have to define it carefully in terms of legal, but I think, you know, it, it's not, this is not mission impossible here. I mean, it's, it's clear what, what the, the tools are that are available to, to these um, sorts of, for lack of better word, scams can, can be. And if you um, make it more difficult, I think it can be very beneficial to the market. So. Yeah. Sure, what, what, what we're reaching here, a conclusion that we are all want to, to avoid the scams. Uh, <laughs> yes, uh, this... Uh, Unless you raise your hand if you're running a scam. That's, that's and you don't a, want to avoid. <laughs> that's a common ground here. Yeah. Okay, I, I have a question about uh, here about um, contract audits. Assuming uh, this is a lawyer, actually, okay. Assuming customer protection, we were talking about customer protection. If we were to recommend contract audits, including information about who audited the smart contracts used in the token sale, in this case, it's gonna be an interactive kind of thing. What are the best practices do you think must be considered for a contract audit? 
Um, so we, we've done, you know, a, a few audits. Uh, the, the process basically uh, from our side is uh, making sure that the logic uh, acts as if it's supposed to. In, uh, we generally try to get a plain language overview of, okay, what exactly are you, are you trying to do here? Um, and in what context? And what are the outcomes that you hope for? Um, and then once we get that out in plain language, then we go over the functions. Um, we usually ask for them to be well documented. Um, and consensus diligence actually came out with a blog post the other day that was pretty interesting. Where uh, right now the majority of the audits, you know, we we take the the code off of GitHub and we read through the source, and then uh, we, we we push back our findings after that. Um, but we also have the disclaimer, you know, this isn't deployed code. Um, we have no control over what parameters they end up using. Um, and then if any of these changes take place, you know, of course, this, you know, nullifies anything that we say about it. Uh, so consensus came out with the idea that uh, let's wait until code is actually deployed on the network. So they'll finish the on a, on a block scanner, such as like an ether scan or something. And then we can pull the code from the vet, from the validated on chain code. And then, um, and then audit that, um, which of course it, it, it gives us a, an extra layer of protection there between the audit and then the, in the end use. Um, so, but yeah, so the process is, is basically, uh, getting everything in context and then, and then looking for bugs. Um, and then we, you know, we'll also put out, you know, if, if there's, because one of the main things with Ethereum is, is a trustless system, right? Uh, we're all going for a trustless environment where you don't have to trust the other party. We all use this neutral uh, network that doesn't care who you are or what you're doing as long as you abide by these algorithms. So um, in order to, to do that, we have to make sure that the software that's being put out there, uh, if it's, you know, if there is... Uh, certain elements that give the other side a particular advantage, um, you know, we'll, 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 we'll put out what we think, you know, are some potential pitfalls, you know, if, um, uh, we, for instance, um, there was a token sale, they use, they use a token controller, uh, and, uh, where this uh, controller gives control of the, of the tokens to the sale, um, and then, and then the sale hands control of the tokens back to the, uh, seller. And there's a bit of an element of trust there that the seller will follow through, uh, with, uh, not minting extra tokens, for instance, you know, if the, if the controller, uh, gives control of minting tokens, um, and then the crowd sale hands control of that back to the sellers after the sale, then there's a potential where the seller could then, um, uh, print or mint, you know, uh, a bunch of extra tokens. They're, uh, they're not incentivized to do that. Um, I think we have a lot of incentives, just economic incentives prevent a lot of things. Um, but, uh, yeah. Okay. Does that answer your question? Sure. Because I guess the question comes out, out um, thinking about, uh, a new set of rules for regulation. And then we, and, and since the lawyers are not developers, they have to ask about, how do they have an extra coverage here? Well, uh, with the uh, audit. So yes, that's a yeah. great answer, thank you. Uh, okay, uh, there's, there's a question uh, here. I don't know if Faith is here or not. <clears throat> Sorry, for Nigeria, obviously, a lawyer from Nigeria, proper financial information happens to be the most relevant issue regulators take into account. Unfortunately, the database is not yet comprehensive because these schemes change with power handover. Can we say to regulators that we are offering a proper or transparent financial information to participants using the protocol along with the benefits of the blockchain immutable properties? Yes, I think so. We talk about transparency. But it's, it's, it's uh, more than a question is I see that like, like, a, like a statement. I mean, in Nigeria, the problem is the, the, the data. 
So yeah. can, can we say regulators that we have more transparent way uh, to show the, the financial movements? Yeah, 100%. Uh, uh, every transaction is visible. The, the entire blockchain is public by nature. Um, so it, it gives an extra layer of ultra transparency where we're not uh, money or crypto moving on, on the blockchain isn't in a private bank network anymore. You know, it's, it's, all, it's all visible when, when you want to see, you know, how much has been sent to a crowd sale. That's, that's public. You know, there's no hiding that. Um, there's no, um, yeah, it, it, it's, it's very transparent. Great. Okay. Um, let's uh, move. Okay, Christopher. Uh, people wants to to see your name. Can I rename you and put your real yeah. name on the? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because <laughs> I'm just asking who is. Where's the name? Okay. Let me just rename you well, here. My, my identity is known now, so. <laughs> <That'd be laughs> I'm asking you, Fike, and. <laughs> We're talking to regulators, so that's to come out now. <laughs> May I or not? You yes. tell me. <laughs> oh, yeah, 100%. Yeah, yeah. Okay, now Christopher is here. Okay. Um, we, uh, uh, here we have a question. Okay, there's, um, let's see, how, uh, MJ, how are we with the time? Well, we pass obviously the time. Okay. Um, <laughs> yes, and I think both if we wanted to, to stay. Uh, Okay, um, because we have to hear, uh, uh, Bernie has the question, he has to ask, and we can uh, pass uh, a little bit KYC, which I also have a question. And then we're gonna go with our bonus guest, Federico, uh, because we're talking actually about protocols and self-regulation, and uh, he was invited uh, by Aldi to join us here. So, okay, uh, let's go with, uh, Bernie, 45 minutes running. Okay, yeah, far, far. okay. People saying here 15 minutes more. Okay, you can vote 15, okay. Um, Bernie, um, you have two questions here. Go with the question, with the first one, and I follow you with the, your second one, which is about KYC. Where is Bernie? Is Bernie here? Bernie, are you there? Oh, he's not there. Hello. Oh, Bernie. Hi, all. Where are you? Okay. Yes, yes I am I'm here. Um, well, I have two questions. Uh, my first question is, uh, what would be the incentives for ICO developers and promoters to adopt this protocol? Um, Christian and Jason, don't you think it would be good to integrate a parameter of minimum funding goal? Maybe, otherwise, we are leaving the final amount of investment in the hands of bidders. So your concern is that the, by minimum, you mean that if you don't reach a minimum sale, then everyone gets their money back or that you require a certain number of people to participate. I, I guess the latter seems impossible. I mean, I guess you can go around and <clears throat> tell people they have to do it, but they might not do it. So it must be uh, the first one. Yeah. Go ahead. You want to <laughs> No, go ahead. I, I've been talking. Yeah, I mean, well, we, the, the protocol does have some parameters like that. There's, you can say what, what the minimum that you would participate is. And the, and the reason is, like, let's say you have to get certain licenses, to, or you have certain like, legal costs, whatever. There are some base fees that you need to get the project off the ground. So you can say that, that um, the, each person can say what they think this minimum is, and if, if the sale uh, doesn't reach their minimum threshold, then they should just get their bid returned to them. Okay. Uh, Bernie, your second question, which is about uh, KYC. We know the protocol doesn't deal with KYC. Uh, I mean, for 
all of the lawyers around. <laughs> okay, but uh, about that, uh, your question, Bernie? Yes, my second question. Is it possible to incorporate in this protocol uh, some functionalities around, uh, around a write whitelist, list, for instance, where it could store its KYC verified contributors? So, it, yeah, it's, it's not in the protocol, but it's absolutely something that can be put into uh, the contract um, to either a whitelist. White, I know there was a question on there, a whitelist of people up front so that you can only participate if you've been registered prior to the sale or, you know, whitelist after the fact and not distribute tokens until they've been cleared after the sale. Uh, the biggest problem that I, that, that from my, from my conversations with uh, KYC providers, since it's so new, there's a couple of them that are just starting up and, and they're starting to offer some of these solutions. And uh, the problem isn't the technology. We can get whatever, whatever regulators need. Um, uh, there's a kind of innovative solutions where um, uh, somebody can register, it routes through like the, uh, the, the screening lists, you know, wh whichever, uh, you know, there's a lot of screening providers that get that screen through de different databases for the different governments and what they need. And then once it clears through all those screens, then the information gets put in a database, but then it's uh, also linked to the address uh, on chain. And so then there's basically, we could basically create a universal database on Ethereum that has a list of cleared addresses basically. So the challenge of course with that is, you know, if somebody has been cleared before and then something happens and, and now they're no longer cleared, you know, we've got to get through uh, deregistering them off that. But Ethereum gives us a universal database of, of, of ability to put addresses of known, known participants uh, onto the blockchain. Uh, but the problem is, the problem is the technology, the problem is clarity. So the technology is super new and the problem with uh, a lot of the guys raising, you know, serious money is uh, we're really uh, just having to work directly with the banks um, to see if they'll, they'll take the money with what we're doing. You know, we can go through all these process, we'll collect this information and we'll push this information through all of these uh, screens. Um, will you accept the money in that case? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Uh, and sometimes no, because the banks don't know what the regulators want. And the regulators say, we want something, we're not sure what it is yet. In the meantime, we're moving forward. You know, we're not, we're not stopping production. We're not, we're not stopping development. We want to keep going. So we're kind of like in this, in this haze where, okay, well, you guys want something. So we'll just kind of guess at what's might be needed. We'll go through this terrorist watch list. We'll go through, you know, this regulator system. We'll go through this screen. And then, you know, hopefully after we get the money, we say we did this process and they'll say, okay, yeah, you're good. Um, because if they say, no, that's not okay. Well, then that, that presents challenges, you know? So yeah, the problem, the problem is clarity on let's get something down to where, okay, we'll collect information, tell us what information we need and what screens we need to go through. Well, that's, that's okay. Oh, oh, following the, with the KYC. Okay. Understanding that the KYC is relevant for regulation. Okay. Let's put in a, uh, hypothetical event here and you tell me if it's possible or not if it makes sense or not um, if the participants can use multiple addresses is is that correct I, I, I mean I can use multiple mm -hmm. okay so it makes no sense to start with a KYC because so you, it's, it's a contrary to, to the design I mean you, I can use multiple addresses, correct? Okay. Um, let's say uh, that the team decides that request KYC to participants who contribute over $10,000 equivalent uh, in, in ETH uh, threshold, okay? So let's say the team say, okay, after, uh, when the token sale is over, we can check the outcome and ask all the token holders over the 10,000 threshold to comply with our KYC as a condition to deliver the tokens. Is that possible? Do you see that possible or too complicated? What happens if they don't provide the information? Then what do you do? I mean, exactly. that, that's, 
<laughs> you would have a, I, <laughs> let's Health say condition. I, decided, I, I changed my mind and I didn't want, I just didn't want to participate. I did, or I, I put in a bunch of signals during the thing to, to I have yes. one real bid and a bunch of fake bids that I'm going to not claim at the end. So uh, I would think it's much better to do it. It's okay. much safer to do it at the beginning because then you have that. Okay. It, I think it is a very interesting question to see like what would, what would to re-inspect the security of the protocol. Let's say you have a list of, of addresses that are whitelisted. First of all, in the protocol, the way it's written, you can only use each address once. You can only create one bid from each address. I mean, I guess you could imagine what each person could have like a finite number of bids, but it's interesting whether you could, uh, I don't know, there might be some interesting games that you can play if you know that there are only um, finitely many. For example, as you get closer to the end and you know everyone's already used their bids, then you may be able, that's also information that can be used to, to um, possibly game the system. In other words, people who go in later have more information and then they're, therefore there's a reason to, to uh, there's some incentive to delay your, your bids, but uh, and it's also it's not a, a formal attack, but just a concern. And it's also a problem that, that say like, okay, the delivery of the, of the tokens depends on the KYC that I require. That's so if, if you do, you're talking about you're talking about hold at the end. If you just said, okay, we're we're you only get your tokens at the end if you provide your KYC. But then what happens if you don't provide it? You just you just right. burn you burn the cash. I mean, yeah, people are going to get angry about that because they'll say, look, I tried to submit it and it didn't go through, or or whatever. They they think that they have the right KYC and they provide the wrong the documents that you know we were looking for this type of document instead of that type. It sounds, I mean, part of the goal of this protocol is to um, reduce uh, reduce the, <laughs> the blame on the person running the auction so that the, anything that can go wrong would have been known to the person before they started. So that was why I suggested to push it to the, to the front. I mean, I guess you still have frustration because if, the KYC goes bad the day before the auction and you don't get to participate. Yeah, but that could be different. There are a lot of ways that people can get annoyed. That's what I think. <laughs> and, and then this also extends into, into further use cases. You know, ICOs are popular right now because the technology is new and we're funding everybody. But what happens when everybody did and then start putting other applications that also deal with value? You know, we're going to be dealing with value on, on the blockchain for the rest of time probably. So. How do we, you know, I think KYC extends just beyond registering before or after a crowd sale. I agree with Jason, you know, doing it pre-sale uh, logistically makes more sense. But then really we, we could be using some sort of KYC system for all applications that will be transferring value at some point. That's a great way to push it onto somebody else's problem. <laughs> yeah. Make, make it Ethereum's problem. I, that's, that's good. Yeah, and trying to, to give form here of this, what is needed and what we have and, and everything in the middle. Yeah. Okay, so, um, uh, okay, timing. Uh, if, we, if you have uh, any question to uh, finish with the question because we need to go with, uh, with further. Um, MJ, are you there? Okay, let's see. MJ, yes, you're there. Um, anyone who had a question, raise your hand right now or be quiet forever. Put it in the chat. Okay, let me see. Kuro. Okay, no raise hand. Okay, I'm gonna uh, keep on with Kira, thank you for putting this together. It has been an education. I have sent out some of the ML KYC components that I'd be happy to share on the Slack channel. Okay, outside of hers. Okay, Kira, do you want to um, say something about the ML? Okay, no worries. Okay, let's move. 
Okay, let's, uh, we're, since we're here in this topic of protocols and self-regulations, um, I want to, um, I want to make a disclosure first <laughs> with Clarence. We have here Federico Ast here. Okay. Uh, Fed is here because, uh, I, well, was admit I invited by Albi, but I have to do a disclosure. Um, I work with Clarence as well with the communication with the Clarence team. Okay. Since our topic here is um, protocols and self regulations. I'd like you to tell us, uh, Fede, uh, in a short sentence because of the time, what is CLERUS and how can CLERUS help to avoid abuse in token sales? I know there, if there's a use case there for CLERUS. <clears throat> Let me unmute it. Okay. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Good. Uh, thanks for the invitation, uh, Tete. <laughs> um, and so, Clarus is a protocol for dispute resolution um, on blockchain. It's an, auto uh, an autonomous organization. So, uh, a very easy use case I always uh, tell is like, imagine I have a, like I hire some web designer from I don't know uh, Guatemala to build a website for me. And um, so uh, we agree on some terms and conditions. So he delivers the product, and then I'm not happy with the product and. Um, I'm not going to go to Guatemala to, to hire a lawyer and like sue him in court, it's too expensive. And even for like one half thousand dollars case, it's not worth it. So if, imagine if we had put the money into a smart contract. And so if everything goes right, everybody's happy. And so the money is transferred. I got the product, he gets the money, everything's good. If there is a dispute about the product, so the money stays locked into the smart contract and there's going to be a jury who's going to be to, to solve the, the problem. So they're going to analyze the evidence and vote on who is right. So this jury is going to be selected, selected by a token that's called the Pinakion because the name comes from the token that the ancient Greek used for selecting their jurors in their popular trials. So, <laughs> and so um, there is a whole system of, of incentives made on game theory and shelling point that incentivizes every juror to vote honestly to analyze the evidence carefully and well and do the do their job so this is a very easy use case uh, but cleros can be used for lots of things and one of them is related to uh, token distribution so now you have the team that uh, sells the token and they get the money from the uh, contributors right Imagine, um, so you don't have really control of what they are going to do with the money, but imagine if the buyers can put the money into a smart contract and they agree with the team in some milestones that are going to be um, agreed by both parties and the money is going to be released as these milestones get, um, they, they get fulfilled by the team, right? So maybe the next milestone is, so we're going to make the next payment when there is the next uh, version of the product, right? So, but you may have a dispute here. So yes, they, the team shows the product, but many of the buyers can say, hey, this is not really a new version. This is like the same old version with a different like interface. So this is not what we agreed upon. So if we have this um, type of dispute, this can be solved by Claros uh, jury, right? So this is are going to be experts in so people who uh, have some kind of expertise in this that self select with the token and they're going to analyze the evidence and the and depending on what their vote is so the money goes to the team or it is withheld in the contract it's a, it's some new piece of regulation of self regulation that may come from the from the space that can help uh, um, like reduce the, the kind of abuse that uh, there has been in this um, in token sales. Uh, of course, it's very early, very early stage, but this is the way that we see the, the self-regulation maybe going in the future. Okay, great. So we have another uh, example of how technology can help on self-regulating. Okay. Well, we have an hour here, we say 30 minutes. <laughs> okay, I really, really thank you everyone uh, to be here. 
Uh, this is, um, thank you for being here. This, this is, has been a part of an experiment of collaboration and collective wisdom, really. We are experimenting, all of us, and we, when we see things like this, like everyone lives in a different time zone and we, met and, and we ask questions and we challenge ourselves. And you know, this is uh, what uh, really moves us. So thank you everyone. Next steps here. The report, um, I don't know, I, I think Jason is, is not uh, familiar with how it's working out. We have, we're gonna have a report, a review, a recommendation based on this question and answer, but also all the material, the research, you know. Uh, uh, it's gonna be drafted by designated lawyers. That lawyer's gonna be voted, okay? We're gonna vote. Uh, you've seen a model of liquid democracy. There's no token here. So there's nothing complicated. It's not carbon vote. You don't have to do it for any transaction. You, you just cast your vote like this because we are, you know, trying to test what is the model that is working uh, well. Okay, so we're going to vote. Vote. You can postulate yourself. You can delegate your vote to a designated lawyer uh, for the draft. Uh, the link is uh, in the Slack. The, the vote is going to be open until January because we have like, uh, holidays here, okay? And we don't want, and we want to see how it's, how it's, it's evolving, okay? After the session, maybe we have a, 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 a one person say, oh, okay, I want to, to bring this and this to the table and we cannot close the vote before the session. So the vote is going to be open until January and the outcome is going to be, uh, uh, we're going to share the outcome with you, with you and with all the community, obviously. And we start working like that. So th this is the whole process of the activity. Uh, this is gonna be recorded. It is recorded. So you can, uh, we're gonna share with you the recording. And obviously uh, we can um, share this piece of knowledge that we have today. Thank you everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jason, Christopher, Bernie, Albi, Marco. Uh, Federico, Carlos, Aaron, oh my God, Bernie, uh, uh, Kirill, Riska, Monique, uh, NJ, Dimitris, uh, someone else? <laughs> no one here. Okay, thank you very much for everything. See you later. All right, thanks. Thank yeah. you. Uh, <laughs> yeah.